Dear Dad, I'm taking some EVA time again today. And why? Well, I just love looking at the Starbow. It's just amazing. I wish you could have seen it before you died. All the universe, every star, every galaxy, all compressed into a brilliant point of multicolored light, so small I can eclipse it with my outstretched hand. Everything that ever was, everything that ever lived, is in that lonely patch of light, in an endless sea of darkness. Okay, maybe that's not the reason. Maybe it's just because I'm feeling lonelier than I ever have. Because I just found out today, Dad, that Jennifer Stannis, yeah, that hard-driving taskmaster who taught me everything I know, well, she decided to retire. A couple days ago. Well, a couple days from my perspective, anyway. And then the old bat went and died on me, leaving me as the oldest human being in the universe. It wouldn't be so bad if I still had my family with me. But ever since I lost Fujiko and Aiden, well, my little girl had to blame somebody, and she chose me, and we ended up going our separate ways. And now I found out that she's decided to give up being a Lancer, decided to get married to some guy she met on a star system almost 50 light years away. What does she have in common with him? He's gotta be at least a century younger than her. So I gotta get to her, Dad. I gotta somehow get what's left of my family back together while I still have time. And she's gonna be in her 40s by the time I finally get there. We'll almost be the same age. I hope I can patch things up. Well, that's about it, Dad. I miss you. So as some of you may be aware, I'm going to be starting another channel that will focus on science fiction stories. I hope you guys enjoyed that little snippet from my first piece of content that I'll be releasing on that channel. And also, I've got a voice actress to help me out. I think a lot of you know her, Ellie in Space. So I'm very excited about everything that's going to be happening with that new channel when I finally get it all put together. Stay tuned. But but in the meantime, I hope I gave all of you some food for thought, because I don't believe that something like warp drive is going to solve all of our interstellar travel problems for us. I do believe that the light barrier is going to be a significant problem that we may never overcome. And why do I believe this? Well, if warp drive was a realistic possibility, I think we would be up to our armpits and aliens right now. Unless we are truly alone in the universe, the Fermi Paradox becomes much more difficult to explain if the vastness of space is no real obstacle, if warp drive allows us to jump from star to star in the space of weeks or even months. There has to be a much more difficult barrier that other civilizations have to overcome that's keeping them from reaching us on a daily basis. There may be somebody watching us right now, but I think they're probably very few few in number, that if a civilization stumbles across us, they do so by accident, because the light barrier prevents anybody beyond 50 or 100 light years away from visiting us on purpose. All of that having been said then, if the only way to practically travel from star to star in a reasonable amount of time is to take advantage of time dilation and the other phenomena that take place very close to the speed of light, that's going to create lots of unique problems for future interstellar travelers. What sort of people would make the conscious decision to leave their lives on Earth or wherever they happen to live behind forever? Because by the time they travel to a star system that's even very 
close by, say 20 light years away, almost an entire generation will have passed on the system they left behind. And if they were to return, almost half a century will have passed. After a few trips, the only people an interstellar traveler would know and still have around would be the people who traveled on the same ship with him, or perhaps people who traveled on different ships experiencing the same time dilation effects. Everybody else would be lost to time, crumbled to dust, as time mercilessly wipes out everything they've ever known. Indeed, even humans on different planets orbiting different stars would have more in common with each other than they would with these mysterious interstellar travelers, because they would only be separated by the few years that it takes communications to travel between stars. Fashions, cultural changes, all of those things would only be separated by a few years or perhaps a generation for stars that lie a little further away from Earth. Whereas these people, well, just like our fictional character in the story I just read to you, they would become centuries out of touch after just a few journeys. So what kind of people would consciously decide to make these kinds of journeys? Well, first of all, let's return to Dr. Ensman's book to assess some of his goals of starflight. Number one, the increased likelihood of the survival and development of the human species. Not very different from what Elon Musk thinks about going to Mars. Two, the enhanced power of a group such as an ethnic or religious minority, an endangered nation, or an ideologically oriented movement to determine its own destiny by freeing itself from the shackles that have restricted its development on Earth by freeing it to become what it chooses to be kind of like the pilgrims in England who decided to go to the New World. Number three, the enormous wealth available from virtually unlimited resources combined with technological skill. Number four, the adventure, excitement, and thrill of beginning afresh and even working to create utopian societies. Number five, the greatly expanded knowledge and opportunities for ongoing scientific research. And number six, the life extension for crews aboard starships which could be made luxurious with profits derived from transporting passengers and cargo. Now, on the other side of the coin, let's look at the hazards of staying. Number one, collision with any of the near-Earth asteroids that cross Earth's orbit or with a large meteorite. Now, of course, that's something that can be avoided by going to a different planet in the solar system, not to a different star system. But if a different star system had a planet that already had an oxygen-nitrogen atmosphere, or at least a less hostile environment than Mars, it would still be attractive. Number two, radiation from a relatively nearby supernova. That's something you could not escape from if you went to a different planet in the same solar system. Number three, encounter with a galactic dust cloud that could first shadow the sun, thus freezing Earth in ice, and then stoke the sun with fresh fuel by falling into it, thereby roasting the Earth. Not a big possibility, but still one that I haven't given a great deal of thought to until I read it. Number four, the sun becoming a variable star. Number five, the possibility that the heart of the Milky Way galaxy may become an active quasar. Now, of course, that's not very likely, but what if some sort of cataclysm like that were to strike the galaxy? As we saw in part one of this series, you could escape the galaxy and go to a planetary system in an entirely different galaxy in about 20 years' time if you take time dilation into account. This is something that frees us from the confines of our own solar system, ensuring the long-term survival of the species. So what kind of people would actually make the journey? Well, it would be a combination of different types of colonists colonists who intend to settle on a new world, or colonists who have decided to make a spaceship their permanent home. They would probably be married couples with a proportion of extra disinterested personnel such as older people or very young people, including children who are born on board ship. The older people could be included for their special skills and would essentially retire to end their days aboard a spacecraft, and some of them would live 
live to see the entry into an alien system. This might be a very good way for people to retire. Coming towards the ends of their lives, given the short amount of time that passes on board ship because of time dilation, they could still end their days on some strange alien world. That could be a very compelling thing to some people. As Dr. Ensman pointed out, courageous volunteers and explorers are compelled to explore, sometimes at great personal risk, and sometimes with the end being almost certain personal destruction. The public forever patronizes and supports with enthusiasm an endless variety of hazardous sports, including tightrope walking, sword swallowing, Hindu asceticism, demolition derbies, cliff diving, and many others. Children born on such ships would become acquainted with ship systems at a very early age, working on flight simulators and various ship systems while they are still young and getting very accustomed to ship-born life until eventually a different life on a planetary surface might seem alien and uncomfortable, creating an entirely different subspecies of the human race that is better suited to space travel, lives longer than everybody else, else and considers themselves to be a different breed apart from the rest of the species. Indeed, you might even have ship's governments or city-state type governments aboard each individual ship, with ship's companies forming separate societies from their passengers who would be very different people in almost every respect, and also these companies choosing their own captains, because keep in mind, a ship's captain would outlive all of their superiors on the planets they left behind, sometimes by many centuries. How then would these so-called superiors be in any way qualified to make any decisions about officer choices or even captaincy choices when the company on board ship would be much better suited to make these kinds of decisions? Indeed, separate governments would no doubt be set up on every planetary system, separated by many light years or even four or five light years, it would be very difficult for any earthbound government to establish any meaningful authority over a colony that far away, separated not only by distance, but also by a significant amount of time. Now, this is not necessarily the case. An extremely authoritative and repressive government on Earth might be able to dispatch their own planetary governors with very strict instructions and also so a sizable military force to impose Earth's will on her colonies. However, this would be a difficult thing to do given the fact that they would need the cooperation of the various crews on these ships who would be entirely different people and uniquely qualified to carry these governors and these troops to these various colonies. In many ways, this separate subdivision of human civilization, these spacers or Lancers, as I call them in my particular story, would be very similar to the spacing guilds of the Dune universe, people who are uniquely qualified to handle interstellar travel for anybody who wants to make use of their services. And if these ships were largely self-sufficient, as the Echo Lance definitely is, it would be very challenging for a repressive government to enforce its will on any particular ship or crew. They could simply head out to a distant star system 40 or 50 light years away and wait for a repressive governor or president, dictator, whatever, to die of old age before they returned once the heat died down. And of course, during that time, Earth would not have use of their extremely valuable ship and skills. In my opinion, if the speed of light remains a barrier that we simply cannot overcome, then interstellar empires are going to be a difficult thing to establish. Even though individual governments on different planets might be repressive overall, this kind of system affords itself very well to independent and free societies rather than repressive governments. An interstellar human civilization is likely to be a loose association of colonies that come together in times of need but otherwise operate pretty much independently. And 
different planetary systems would have different requirements. For example, if we're talking about a planet tidally locked orbiting a red dwarf, a very harsh place to live, they might be more reliant on other colonies for their survival than a society fortunate enough to be living on a twin of Earth orbiting a G-class star. But in the midst of all of it, the glue that would hold human civilization together would be this unique and different group of people manning these ships. These apparently immortal people living for centuries while the rest of us live out our normal everyday lives who make transportation between the stars possible. This would be a unique and amazing lifestyle that might prove attractive to some, although I admit that most humans would have a very difficult time adjusting to this sort of life. That being the case, though, it is possible. This is something that we can accomplish sometime in our future. We aren't working aggressively towards achieving interstellar travel at this point. Even interplanetary travel is something that's eluded us for quite some time. But it's something we should work towards in the long run. Those who scoff at the notion of colonizing the solar system are right in one important respect. There is no planet or moon in the solar system system nearly as attractive as our own. Every other environment in the solar system is extremely hostile and will remain so until we can manage to terraform them, a process that will likely take centuries, if not millennia. The only way to find a planet similar to Earth is to explore other star systems, and the only way to do that is by using relativistic spacecraft like the Ensman Echo Lance and by means of the types of people that will choose to crew them. Smash that like, hit that subscribe. Thank you very much for watching. If you haven't seen part one of this series, by the way, I'll have it linked at the end of this video. Please check the description for various ways to support my content. And as always, stay angry about space.